Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this new episode of the Body Swaps and Friends uh, webinar. Let me share my screen uh, quickly. There we go. So the topic of today is, is a mouthful, is from the classroom to the real world. How can we bridge the gap between, uh, well, the gap in human skills uh, with AI and, um, and XR? So um, I'm Chris, I'm the CEO of Body Swaps. For those of you who don't know us yet, Body Swaps is essentially a, a flight simulator for soft skills that uses artificial intelligence and virtual reality to try and bridge that gap. But we'll talk about this a little bit later because today I'm mostly here as your host. Uh, I am joined by two wonderful humans, uh, Lucy Mottram from Sheffield Hallam University and Gemma Witchett from the University of the West of England. Uh, and you see that I added uh, Giovanni AI, who is our now infamous AI co-host. Uh, I brought back Giovanni because uh, of the success of his presence at the last webinar and overall starting to play with the idea of trying to bring AI as, as this kind of co-intelligence, as a collaborator to everything we do and see what works, but also, and sometimes funnily so, uh, what does not work um, with that. Um, so what brings us here today? We really want to go from the big picture to the practical. So the big picture today, we'll talk with, with uh, Gemma and Lucy about what is the status quo of, of you know, human skills in healthcare and the response that education can give today to those needs and how can new learning technologies such as XR and AI and the combination thereof um, help answer those needs. But then obviously this is not a crystal ball gazing uh, exercise. We really want to be practical and that's why with Gemma and Lucy we'll, we'll go quite deep, quite granular into what it takes to actually challenge the status quo one learner um, at a time. And so speaking of, uh, of practical stuff, so I, mentioned, uh, I mentioned Giovanni. So um, Giovanni is uh, ChatGPT for the text, uh, 11 labs for the voice, and DID, so that's D-ID, uh, for, uh, for the visual. Um, once you register to those to to those uh, to those services, which was free, if you want to, with free trials, it takes less than ten minutes to create what you're going to see. So what I did is I gave Giovanni the description of uh, the event on LinkedIn, uh, and I asked it to uh, to prepare an opening, so 150 words, looking for a hook, uh, the promises, uh, and the challenges. Uh, and I also told Giovanni that he was Italian, funny, and grumpy. And also what you're going to see now is the unedited version uh, of this. Uh, and that's me being a little bit lazy, leaving AI to open uh, to open and set the scene. So let's see. Buongior buongiorno, everyone, and welcome to the Body Swabs and Friends webinar. So here's a shocking fact for you. Medical errors, often because of gaps in human skills, are the third leading cause of death in the US. Yeah, you heard me right. 250,000 fatalities a year. Mamma mia, that's like the population of a small Italian city. Imagine the transformation if practitioners could hone their skills in a safe, immersive environment before ever touching a patient. AI and XR technologies offer this potential, enabling students to practice complex interactions with patients and other healthcare professionals repeatedly until they achieve mastery. This could elevate the quality of care and the well-being of practitioners. But hold your horses, there are a few worries too. Can technology really teach empathy? I mean, can you learn bedside manners from a machine? Will reliance on simulations diminish real-world readiness? These are big questions, and today we'll dive into both the promises and pitfalls of immersive learning in healthcare. Ciao. So I'm not, I'm not sure why there was such a gap uh, before he said ciao. So that's that's unedited. It's quite interesting. It's also quite weird. It doesn't fully work, but I think some of the parts, especially the ones that I put in bold here, um, are good. Imagine the transformation if practitioners could hone their skills in a safe, immersive way before touching a patient, but also can technology really teach empathy and communication skills? So the the I think in terms of scene setting, it's pretty good. I wanted to add uh, 
a little thing uh, before uh, uh, before we move forward, and that's that's the fact that we we talk in the title of the webinar about um, AI and XR as if they were like completely different technologies that are applied in a completely different way. But today we're talking about soft skills training. We're not talking about say AI for predictive analysis of health data or uh, VR for surgical training, and when it comes to soft skills training, it's the combination of virtual reality and artificial intelligence that really is uh, is the breakthrough. On the virtual reality side of things, what you have is embodied immersion. So embodied immersion means that VR is the, the first learning module short of reality, a learning modality short of reality in which you embody someone, right? You are living an experience. You're not consuming content, be it video or, or slides or whatever. You are, it is happening to you. And from a, a cognitive perspective, experience is very uh, different from acquisition of knowledge. The second aspect that's interesting with VR when it comes to soft skills is the emotional aspect, the affect that you can get. When you embody um, a, a doctor or a nurse and you are going to interact with other professionals or patients, um, the, the power of the scenario, of the script, of the acting, of the storytelling, the emotion that is conveyed does participate in the learning itself. Uh, and finally, it's the idea of application, right? You don't have um, the real world, your real uh, bedroom or classroom acting as a buffer between the learning content and yourself. You are in the learning environment in which you will later need to, 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 to practice. And that means that the applicative effect of learning in VR is much uh, stronger. Obviously, this is reinforced by uh, AI, especially uh, LLMs recently. So I put a little star next to human-like conversations because we're not there yet. There's several dimensions to what makes a conversation humans. There's what is said, but also how it is said, be it the voice or the facial expressions. And I just don't think we quite there just yet, as we've seen with, with Giovanni AI a minute ago. It's, it's a little bit in the uncanny valley. And if you're talking high stakes communication skills in healthcare, whether you would leave that entirely to, to, to an AI is, is a big question. Maybe we'll talk about that later today. Um, but what AI allows certainly is adaptive practice, is for the learning experience to evolve with the learner um, and be more efficient in that way. And also it allows for hyper-personalized uh, feedback. So it's the, it's the combination of all that that creates what I named pills, just so everyone can can remember it. And if you're thirsty, you want to watch a Euro game, but it's personalized immersive learning simulation. In other words, without AI, learning soft skills in VR is a little bit dumb. It's a little bit rigid. But without VR, learning soft skills with just AI well, that's just a chatbot, so you have to be ca uh, uh, careful as well. So today is not about the technology, it's about the learning performance that uh, that it unlocks. Um, before we move forward, uh, time for a quick, uh, quick question. So please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code uh, that is shown here. Um, I just want to check before we start um, how you feel uh, in terms of your institution's current use of those technologies, but also your your own level of confidence. Um, so let's assume that you have been on there, either on a new tab or on your phone. Uh, we're going to start seeing uh, the results normally soon on how your institution is currently using immersive learning. There we go. It's starting to come through. So what we can already see uh, was is, is two things. Uh, first, there are people everywhere, but extensive use. I think everyone here is quite uh, uh, humble. Uh, there we go. Uh, and obviously, uh, Gemma and Lucy are not voting. Otherwise, we would see a little bit more yellow. Um, but we can also see that people are at uh, at different um, at different stages uh, on the uh, on the journey. With the majority, interestingly, being on slight use. So being at the beginning. Uh, in this kind of like early adoption phase and precisely at the moment where you have to take the results of those pilots and turn those results into large scale adoption, making immersive learning the new normal uh, and going from a couple of headsets, a few uh, dozen sessions from 
thousands and thousands of sessions like UWE and Sheffield Hallam. Um, well, it takes a lot of work and uh, that's perfect because that's what we're going to talk about uh, about today. Um, if we go to the next question now, which is more about your individual level of confidence, how confident are you personally uh, using and deploying immersive learning tech? So we're starting bang in the middle. Let's give it a few a few seconds. So so far, pretty well uh, distributed and going to the side of confidence. So again, what's interesting here, there's no there's no one size fits all. Uh, the level seems to be a level of confidence seem to go across the board, uh, with, with maybe maybe slightly slightly um, focused in between, um, in the middle and, and and becoming good. But certainly, there's a lot a lot of movements we can do towards the right, towards becoming more confident, uh, at deploying the technologies so as to also move uh, the level of use at the institution level uh, towards the right. So. Um, Let's uh, let's take it without further ado uh, into uh, into the presentations, and we are going to start um, with Lucy uh, Lucy Mottram from Sheffield Hallam University. So Lucy is a principal lecturer in adult nursing at Sheffield Hallam University. Her role has included the design and implementation of simulated placements across the undergraduate nursing curriculum. Lucy is currently studying for a doctorate in education and is obviously very passionate about the use of simulation in healthcare education. Lucy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Nice to see you, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about my experience as a, a lecturer in implementing um, virtual reality for a simulated placement. Now, I am not um, a technical kind of person. As a nurse, I've managed ventilators in intensive care and so on. As a lecturer, my limit was probably PowerPoint. So not very familiar with virtual reality at all. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, our students were pulled from clinical placements, so they couldn't go on their placements. Um, and they were either sat at home waiting to be given the all clear to go back or they were self-isolating. But we still had this requirement from the Nursing and Midwifery Council that our students needed to achieve 2,300 hours during their course of uh, clinical placement in, it, in order to graduate. So it was really critical that we um, got them through the course and got those clinical hours for them. In 2021, the NMC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, said that we were allowed to use simulation for some of those hours. And initially, that was just an emergency measure. Um, but it's actually now a long term part of the nursing curriculum. So we've gone from an emergency situation to something actually now that's embedded in the curriculum and that we have to continually improve to ensure an excellent student experience. Um, each student has to achieve 38 and a half hours of simulation every single week and we can have as many as 800 students on a simulated placement at once. Obviously we don't have an endless pot of money to um, sort of recruit tons and tons of new staff and build lots of new simulation uh, services and an estate and things so we've had to be really creative in in how we achieve that and um, we've also got adult student nurses child mental health and learning disability so we want something that suits all those different professions of course, we do lots of face-to-face -face simulation on a mock ward or in a clinical skills room, and we practice on plastic and do lots of clinical skills training as well. We've been able to bring in service users, either on Zoom or Teams or face-to-face -face on campus um, to chat about their experiences of health and social care. And we've used a platform called Care Opinion, which is a little bit like TripAdvisor for hospitals and health and social care. So that they've all brought the service user voice into our simulation. We've had students doing community projects and self-directed learning. But then we also started to explore virtual reality as well, which is something that was completely new to us as a department. We were lucky enough to secure a bid from Health Education England, as it was at the time. And so we began doing a bit of market research and chatting to different companies about the software that they had and the headsets available. Um, we initially purchased 
Oxford Medical Simulation and Body Swaps, as well as several other um, different software packages and headsets with that money. But that was just for a year. So after that year, we really had to justify spending that extra money on renewing any packages and really hone down to which packages worked for us as healthcare educators. We learned lots along the way. We did make some mistakes. I know a colleague purchased tethered he headsets when they should have purchased untethered, and it was just a whole new world to us. Um, so we did set up a VR steering group um, to sort of cut through the red tape learn and work more collaborat collaboratively together as an organisation. So I just wanted to chat to you about two of the different products that we purchased and how they really complemented each other and worked nicely together to achieve our students' learning outcomes. Um, so as a student nurse, you have a whole host of proficiencies that you have to achieve each year. Some of them are very technical, so inserting an NG tube, administering a blood transfusion, and some are what we call non-technical skills, um, such as communication, breaking bad news, decision making, teamwork. Um, so we wanted two platforms that would really complement each other and cover the technical skills and the non-technical. So for technical skills, we went for Oxford Medical Simulation. You can see a picture of it there, and that's the view that the student would have. Um, you can either just have it on a laptop or a phone, you can have it on a large screen in a classroom, or you can use a virtual reality headset. So it was perfect for using at home during lockdown and then bringing it onto campus as we returned back to some kind of normality. Um, so students worked in a group with a facilitator and they were able to talk to the patient, ask them questions, assess them physically, undertake any tests they wanted to, like an x-ray or a blood test or check the blood pressure. They were able to give the patient medication and fluid. They could ring somebody up and ask for help, so a, a, a doctor or another colleague or a relative of the patient. And they had to manage the scenario, it was timed, and decide a treatment plan. And there was then a subsequent period of guided reflection to enable them to debrief and reflect on how they'd managed that scenario. So time, uh, timekeeping, decision making, uh, and so on. And the second platform was Body Swaps, which we felt really complemented um, Oxford Medical Simulation and allowed our students to test their non-technical skills. Um, so they were able to undertake this independently using the headset or on their phone or laptop. One thing to say that we really liked about this as well is that it meant actually in terms of resourcing, the students could undertake this independently and gain feedback and assess their performance. So it really helped in terms of resourcing and not needing a practice supervisor or a lecturer to be present with the student all the time. So the students were under, able to undertake a simulated scenario that allowed them to test their verbal and non-verbal communication skills. So, for example, dealing with conflict, equality and diversity, um, employability. And at the end, they were given feedback on their performance and were able to retest and improve their performance. So just to sum up my top tips from everything we've learned as complete novices venturing into the world of virtual reality, make sure before you buy anything that you have the infrastructure to ensure the process of onboarding is as smooth as possible. So think about GDPR and legal issues relating to students having an account. Think about finance. IT, do you have um, the infrastructure in terms of IT and Wi-Fi and your uh, hardware to, to accommodate the package that you're going to purchase and so on? Um, consider whether you want to buy or rent so that you can upgrade your headsets as products develop and become uh, better and improve. Think about your learning outcomes. So it's no good just implementing something like this without having clear learning outcomes and being able to scaffold your learning throughout the levels of study. Um, think about whether the scenarios are inclusive. So the characters in the scenario or if the students have to design an avatar as with body swaps. 
and make sure that your team are on board. So think about staff development, perhaps having a VR champion for your department or your school or college and the technical support. So who's going to make sure your headsets are charged and maintained, set things up, support you in class if there's an IT issue um, and, and that really underpinning infrastructure that the academics will need to support the session. And that's me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Lucy is very, very, very helpful. And um, for context, I know you have done literally thousands of sessions in Bodyswap, so so you, you have managed to, to deploy very much, uh, very much at scale. Um, moving to the to the second quick presentation before we have a panel and a Q&A. So if you have any questions uh, for, for Gemma or, or Lucy, please do prepare all those questions and share them on the on the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's hear from Gemma. So Gemma is technical educator at the University of the West of England uh, in Bristol. Uh, Gemma is a radiographer by background uh, and she's works, she works across a wide range of programs at the School of Health and Social Wellbeing. She plans and delivers uh, skills and simulation training and is part of the immersive learning project team. Gemma, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. I'm part of a, a big immersive project that we've had here at UE alongside colleagues from the Digital Learning Service, uh, the technical team of which I'm part, um, the uh, academics themselves and IT. All of us have had a huge learning curve, curve after, over the past sort of two years or so, and it's really starting to take off um, uh, and picking up speed. And my hope is with this presentation, I can talk more to the sort of practicality side of the, uh, things. Being a technician, it's around the logistics and what we found, um, you know, along our journey and hoping that I can share some of that with yourself that complements with uh, what Lucy has been speaking to. So we are very lucky here to have invested in quite a bit of uh, extended reality equipment such as Oculus Quest for our virtual reality, we've got hollow lenses for our augmented reality, two immersive rooms and um, iPads as well that have really uh, helped us out. And here's just a slide to show some of the programs that we've used to deliver or make content with our learners over the past couple of years. And we've done it with many different types of learners, many different group sizes, used it in very many different ways, whether that be um, online and virtually at home that the students are accessing the material in the immersive room uh, that we have, or with things like VR that tends to take a little bit more so I'm probably going to talk more to around the practicalities of how you can make virtual reality use because that tends to be uh, the thing that's a bit more tricky and we've done um, in body swaps alone 716 of our 4,700 odd have been in VR so we've really quite got this scalability down um, so I'm hoping to impart that we've got 400 students going through over the next two days uh, doing Goliath and we've only got 20 headsets so um, we need to make sure that everything's in place to do things as smoothly as possible at a large scale so some of the things I'm going to talk to around the safety considerations the facilitation of the sessions themselves and some of the equipment that we found really useful. So with regards to safety, it's important to note that it might not be um, appropriate for everybody to participate in things like virtual or augmented realities. This could be down to medical conditions such as motion sickness, um, or it could be uh, medical implant devices. We always need to make sure that when we're using this equipment, we're working with um, the manufacturer's guidelines around safety. So right at the start of a session, we let the students know the health and safety around those products and whether it's appropriate for them to use them, but most importantly, that they are aware that they don't have to participate in things like virtual and augmented reality if it is not appropriate for them to do so, that we always able them to access the learning content through a different means, whether that be on an iPad to view augmented reality rather than in a HoloLens headset, or whether they can watch a 2D version of a virtual reality experience so they can still see the content that way. Um, motion sickness tends to be the most common thing that people can't tolerate, uh, VR for example, and it only gets worse with time. So we always make sure that the students know right at the beginning, look, if you're starting to feel uh, queasy or anything like that, don't try and push through it don't worry, we can get you onto an iPad so you can still um, access the content in that different way. 
Um, so we also insist that any VR sessions are no more than 25 minutes as, as, as per uh, manufacturer guidelines tend to be anyway. Um, we have chairs around for those that do get disorientated. So you can see on this picture here, this is one of the, the first sessions uh, that we did with Goliath. Uh, we've got a, a chair at every station. Should have any have anybody got a disorientated or felt sick or anything like that, we could take the headset off and they could sit down until they felt better. Um, but it also works for if somebody wanted to access the content. A lot of virtual reality experiences don't have to be um, stood up you could be sit down such as like body swaps that's ideal because they're actually sat down in the experience itself so we give people the option to to access things in a chair it's a little bit more complicated in something like goliath or notes on blindness where there's content all around um it just might mean that they need to swivel in the chair but it doesn't seem to be a problem they have a dual use as well because it denotes the safe space that the students are in. So you'll see on the floor there, um, as I say, one of the first sessions, we were a lot more cautious with the amount of space that we wouldn't let each learner have. You've got something called a boundary in the headset, which means if somebody was to walk out of that denoted space, they won't see the content, they'll see the actual real room to make sure that people aren't walking around bumping into each other. And we started off with a drawn boundary with the tape on the floor, but the more confident that we've become as facilitators, the more we're going towards the stationary boundaries that are inherent in the devices, which is great because then you can get more learners in the room depending on what it is that they're doing. If it's something too interactive, then you want to separate them a bit further. Um, and again, with the confidence of the uh, facilitators, in setting things up we're tending to need less facilitators to student ratio now we used to do it one to six you'd have one facilitator to six students uh, but now we're more confident we're going more towards one to ten especially now that the learners are becoming more and more used to using things like virtual reality knowing how to control them etc we're needing less uh, staff to facilitate to help those facilitating staff there's a few things that we've picked up along the way um, Device management, for example. So this is if you've got a large number of headsets and devices, it can take a long time to um, apply the programs to each headset individually. So we're looking here at UE to get a device management system, which is something that you have to um, pay for licensing wise. But then you're able to deploy any applications to each headset automatically just by pushing it out to all the devices all at once. You're able to um, give access to to users on those devices as well so it's something that's really happy uh, you know really handy when you're talking sort of large scales now kiosk mode is something as well that you can get um, within device management systems where instead of the uh, people having to put the headset on launching the application that you're wanting to use resetting it in between each learner kiosk mode just make sure the minute the headset's put on, they've already got access to the exact um, application that they want. And that can really streamline the process. And again, that's something that we're looking at getting here at UE soon. Another thing to say about the people facilitating those devices, it's really important that not only are they able to know how the devices work, but they are familiar with the content that you're using in those devices. Because once you've got a learner in a headset, and you can't see what they're seeing. It's really hard to try and orientate yourself to whereabouts they are in that program to be able to give them the advice to say, actually, uh, you might need to be clicking this button here at this point, or you might need to be looking behind you. Um, so it's it's really pertinent that not only are people familiar with the devices and the problem shooting, um, but also the actual applications that you're doing as well. With regards to how we've helped our learners with the devices, um, we found it really useful to have instructional videos that can make sure that you're given all the content that's required, such as the health and safety information at the beginning, so you don't miss anything, how they put the headsets on, and then how they access the content in the application itself and how to orientate them way through it. Having it in a video format also really helps that it's a succinct time, because when you're trying to get a massive uh, throughput of numbers of students going through the process, you need to keep to strict time scales. So you're able to put that into your, your planning time. You're just adding this video on giving a little eBay what people settle in and then the time of the experience that you're gonna do as well. 
We also make sure that we let our learners know that it might be that we need to physically touch them to assist them. Again, when you're in VR, they can't see you and they might not be able to locate a button, for example. And the best way to describe that is to say, I might need to just touch your finger here just to show you the, the control. So important to think around consent, around physical touch, and it might be necessary. Privacy wise, um, this is something that we've noticed in things such as body swaps, where the learners are encouraged to talk to um, people, uh, virtual patients in this scenario. They can be very self-conscious. So um, we have we started out using background sounds uh, when you've got lots of learners in the, the, the space. You can put on a, a coffee shop ambient sound on a YouTube loop video and that background chatter just stops them being quite so self-conscious but over time we've invested in um, headsets as well to help with that to make sure that they really engage with the content so moving on to useful equipment that we found like I said headsets for that reason of um, being able to feel a bit less self-conscious but also it can really help with their immersion and some experiences that are particularly sensory um, like auditory sounds in something like notes on blindness um, it's really um, enhanced that immersion for our learners comes with a slight downside it's another piece of equipment that you have to put on the students heads and they that they need to be um, happy to tolerate uh, but also you lose track then of being able to hear where a learner is in the learning content so um, just just to um, consider that. Uh, the medical equipment that we have here on the right hand side, this is wonderful, this is like belts and braces, in between each learner we make sure that they wipe down their headsets with alcoholic wipes um, but the UV light that these boxes provide after a whole session has run we just put the headset on for two minutes it just blasts it with ultraviolet light and it gets rid of any sort of nasty um, microbes etc so it just really helps with infection control and doesn't take too much time we love our storage cases on the left here. This is one of um, our boxes for our hollow lenses. Um, it's really great because we can transfer six headsets at one time, but we can also charge six headsets with one plug. Uh, there's a lot of battery and charging issues that we need to keep on top of. So this, this is really kills two birds with one stone for us. Um, we also really like the upgraded straps that we've got on our Oculus Quests. They're adjustable, they're easier to, to clean, and they have the added benefit that we can put an extra battery because you need to consider battery life when you're running sessions from nine in the morning till five at night. There's quite often a rotation of batteries and you're able to see on that external battery how much battery life you've got left. Otherwise, you're having to look in the headset. So really, really useful piece of equipment there. And that's about all the tips that I, I've got. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Gemma. There was a... Um, uh, that was really, really great. Really, as I as I told everyone at the beginning, uh, we we went down into the into the practical here and how to make things happen for literally uh, nearly ten thousand sessions in the in the case of body swap. So, um, a scalability is possible uh, with with virtual reality, but it is it is indeed a lot of work. Um, let's bring Lucy back uh, and have a a flash panel uh, very quickly. Three questions. Um, the first one is going to be for you, Gemma, T taking a step back before we reach that kind of, of level of scale um, to go from the pilot stage where most of the attendees today are to, to where you are, you need to, you need to get the educators on board, not only the students to love, love, love the applications, but the educators themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any experience to share, any tips to share on how to get the, the educators on, on board with those programs? Yeah, um, so uh, myself and um, Daph Rees has uh, been quite um, involved in this at UWE. We've made sure that you consult educators right from the beginning, that we're getting the right equipment. As you quite rightly said, Lucy, it needs to be all around the learning outcomes that we need to consider. So we did sort of showcases of the possibilities of all the uh, potential devices and the potential applications that may or may not be pertinent. So we invited educators to these showcases for the initial sort of scouting. Um, and then once you've sort of consulted which might be the most appropriate it's around the making sure that people are confident to use this it's all about um you know the confidence uh, to 
know that they'll be supported in the sessions. Again, Lucy spoke to this earlier. It's having the, the technical support, the digital learning service, the IT, everybody on board to be able to make sure that the educators themselves feel comfortable to help um, facilitate these sessions. So getting them right from the get go, making sure we're, we're getting the correct equipment first off. Sometimes it's um, for the initial uptake, the people that are more confident may come forward, but then after a while, making sure that you go to individual programs and saying that this is what's out here, we can support you through that. These are the people that are using it successfully and sharing that confidence and competence. Great. And and one for, for, for Lucy, uh, similar question, but but different stakeholders. So let's let's imagine you've you have invited your your educators and they've tried OMS and body swaps and, and others and, and they say I want that. It makes sense to do simulated placement, for example. Um, let's say that that the students you that have tried it out are are happy. Um, at some point, uh, senior leadership is going to have to buy in. Quite literally speaking, um, any any advice on how to get the, the the senior leadership side of the of the institutions to to uh, yeah to, to get on board. Yeah, so it's really about doing your market research first. So looking what's out there on the market, how it addresses the learning outcomes that you need to address and is it appropriate for your learners? Uh, we went to a VR roadshow where we all got to try the headsets and the different software to see which ones we we felt were most suitable. And then it was about pulling everything together in, in a, an easy to understand document around what we would like to purchase, how much will it cost, is there a discount if we purchase it over a longer period of time, and how will it benefit our learners, um, and things like, is it a pay-per-use license, or how many um, sort of seats, or how many, how many licenses will that enable you to achieve? So it's just about getting across the cost effectiveness and the benefit for the student experience. And in your, in your experience, uh, both of you, what's the right order in which to play it, right? Do you do you you know do a few students first, like you identify solutions, do it with a few students, narrow it down, do it with educators, then go to the leadership, or do you play it uh, in a in another in another way? I think as staff, we did the market research before students saw anything because there's such a wide range of things out there. If you show the students everything, <laughs> we, would never, we would never purchase anything. So then once we'd narrowed it down, we allowed the students to pilot it. Uh, and it was a sort of a combination between their feedback, our feedback, the cost effectiveness, whether you could rent it or buy it and all the different other sort of considerations. Mm. Yeah, that's okay. the same as the experience here at UE, yeah. And so one thing you just mentioned, uh, and that will be the, the, the last question before we move into the audience Q&A, is the impact, the, the, the cost effectiveness. Um, so how do, you, how do you measure the, the, the impact of, the, of those applications and how do, you build, how do you build a use case? How do you build a, a cost benefit analysis to go from, you know, a... A, a pilot to something that hopefully will become the, the new normal, so to speak. Gemma, if you want to go first. Um, I think it's um, especially around feelings of uh, competence. Um, so before and after the experience, capturing information, not just after an experience, oh yeah, you know, that was really good. It's like, um, as, as built in in body swaps, for example, there's a question at the beginning, you know, how, how do you feel your skills levels lie here? And then seeing that checking that there's an up, you know, increase afterwards is really good evidence. Um, or, you know, gathering that on a questionnaire format where they can say, you know, the very same at the end of the session, you can say, what do you feel it was before and afterwards to make sure that we are making an impact. Okay. And uh, Lucy, do you have anything to, to add to that? I would agree with Gemma, but I would just add, interestingly, when we analysed our student feedback, so looking at how confident they felt before and after, in some modules, their confidence levels grew, which was fantastic. In some modules, their confidence level actually went down a little bit, and we think it was because they, they were so sort of blasé and felt really confident mm. about something beforehand, having not had much experience of it, like, for example, Breaking Bad News, the undertaking the module made them sort of realise how much more to it there was 
than they initially thought and they learned more which then made them feel perhaps more cautious and perhaps safer practitioners as well which was a really interesting thing yeah that we anticipate. That's a good thing that yeah mm -hmm. that they picked up on that yeah yeah it's a it's it's something we've observed across the 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 data in in, in all modules Interestingly enough, especially around um, diversity and inclusion, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is is the, the level of confidence goes down before it goes up. Yeah. Um, which which sometimes might be counterintuitive at the end of a pilot when you go, well, my students are less uh, confident doing this than they were at the beginning of, of, of the pilot, and that's that's it's hard for me to draw the line between the level of confidence and the level of of, of competency on a scale, and sometimes actually. Becoming less confident is the first step towards becoming more uh, 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 competent. Um, that's been very helpful. I'm now going to ask the, the the secretive team uh, uh, in the studio, so to speak, to uh, send us some questions from the uh, from the audience, um, and we're going to see um, we're going to see what lands here. I've seen a few come through. So, first question from uh, Paul at Sandwell. Uh, what barriers did you come across in getting staff buy-in? Um, how did you overcome? So I think I think we 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 mentioned those um, uh, a little bit in terms of the uh, of the barriers. So you, I think we need to separate the staff between the educators and the senior leadership. And I think when it comes to the to the educators, if I'm correct, and let me know if I if I'm forgetting anything. There's almost a, a two-step process. The step one is to get them interested and i was like just organizing those events putting headsets on people's heads creating that wow moment but then immediately after say you will be supported because we have the it we have the facilitators we have and and and, and so on is that is that correct yeah i think i think barriers wise it's it's having the time to learn this new way of working <laughs> i don't know if you'd agree there lucy yeah definitely confidence competence and time to yeah. develop those yeah so the, the smoother we can make that progress and learn from each other like I say you know it, it going out slowly rather than all at once you've got all of this kit coming making sure that you know where your priorities are um little by little each thing at a time because it's, it's, it's a lot to, to take on but have that support there where there's people to help you through for example um you know uh, we're lucky that our, our technicians and digital learning service are quite familiar with the content so that we we um, are able to support the educators through each session at the moment but the more they repeat doing this the, the less support that's going to be required down that end mm -hmm. and you, you you mentioned something at the, at the beginning you see around the the nmc so the nursing and midwifery uh, council which is kind of the equivalent of the ASCN in the US for those joining us from the US. Um, and there is this, this increased uh, focus on, on experiential communication skills learning. And, and so you have those domains or those, those competencies that you have to deliver as part of the curriculum. And my, my question, Lucy, is how do, you, how do you work once the educators have bought in? The next steps is kind of like you know, looking at the curriculum and saying, well, I can help you here, here and there. Right. How, how do you work together with with the lecturers to to actually, you know, like enrich their their courses, save them time, uh, which is the, 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 the ultimate step of buy in, I, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of mapping work that needs to be undertaken before you can actually implement this. So first, you've got to look at the scaffolding up the curriculum. So level four as a new student healthcare professional to level five to level six just before they qualify or level seven uh, master's level study so you've got to scaffold and look at your sort of module outcomes and see where this fits with the content and with the level of um, competence that students should have in each level of study then sideways as well so how does each module complement each other and um, so for example something around person-centered care might be um, around the non-technical skills and communication something that's a much more practical module it might be around the NG tube insertion and different competencies um, but then also in terms of clinical proficiencies which again are scaffolded throughout the course we have to map 
what can each piece of software or each scenario do and which proficiency does it address so that we can then say to our learners by undertaking this package um, th or this um, piece of software you are meeting these proficiencies and the students can then reflect, gather evidence and um, do activities such as even completing a care plan for, for the patient that was in the bed or the person that they met in the scenario. So it's all about gathering evidence then to support their assessment. And I have, um, I have a, a follow up here, which is now looking at the, at the, at the students. It's interesting because you, you both have done, have done thousands of, of, of sessions and how do you how do you get the students to care? Is it you know do you have to make it part of the curriculum and this is part of your grade and that and and that's it? Is this the best way to get them to engage? What what, what did you find as as techniques to to get the, those numbers up? So um, you don't usually with VR and AR it doesn't take much persuasion. There might be people that are a little bit. Uh, worried about it uh, but it doesn't usually take much um, to get them in headsets they they're very much keen to do so um, with regards to online um, if it's towards placement hours for etc you know it's it's almost you know it's mandated it's 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 you know it's part of their hours so um, that's quite a big incentive and then we can make sure that they're engaging with the content because we've got the the evidence there that they've been doing that so, um, but it doesn't take most of our learners have, you know, really enjoyed, uh, whether it be in VR or, um, uh, you know, remotely from home, accessing content that way. Um, they've all said how valuable it is and being able to repeat it. And yeah, it doesn't take too much persuasion. I don't know if you've had a different experience, Lucy. No, we did find that. So there was an initial novelty and students were very excited by the novelty. They loved the facilitated sessions with with one particular platform. We we facilitated it in level four and five, and then we gave students their own license in third year, and we found that they didn't engage with it so much independently. Mm -hmm. They really valued doing that as a group mm -hmm. with their peers um, and feeling safe and scaffolded with a facilitator. Um, so depending on the platform, it's just about looking. At, which the students value most, which approach, independent or mm. collaborative. Yeah, and we've used we've used uh, platforms such as um, Body Swaps. We've used that collaborati collaboratively in a session where they've accessed on the PC as a group, and then um, they've used a mentee, <laughs> just as we're doing today, so that they're able to, as a group, decide the best responses um, and the best, you know, cho multiple choice questions and things like that. And then you get to hear the discussions amongst. Oh, that's funny. I would have said such and such. Oh, why is that? You know, and it really, um, it really helps with discussion around that. So yeah. Brilliant. Well, this is the perfect segue because we're going to end the Q&A part with a mentee. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to ask questions uh, to the uh, to the audience and ask you, the panelists, uh, to comment. So if you if you haven't closed the page yet, mentee.com, and then you can enter that code. I believe the first question, the first of the those last two questions, um, is around uh, the benefits that uh, you are expecting from uh, implementing uh, immersive learning. So it would be interesting to compare the expected benefits uh, for uh, for the attendees with the benefits maybe that, that you, Gemma and Lucy, have, uh, have actually experienced uh, and versus maybe your, uh, your, uh, your expectations. Um, and as, as we wait for, for, uh, for, for people to to fill that in, I have a I have a quick intermediary question, which is, if you could send a message through time to yourself two years ago, let's say uh, before you started that, that that entire program, what would be that? You know, you have one sentence. You just have time to to, to give one sentence uh, as a word of advice to to yourself two years ago. What 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 would that be? Besides, go with body swaps. <laughs> um. Uh, 
that's a difficult one. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let it. Uh, it would be just reassurance, more. I think, that you can do this, and it will. You will be able to scale this up, and <laughs> yeah. Reassurance that it's it, it's doable. Um, yes, it's doable. Yeah. I think that now showing it in reality. So, in terms of the of the benefits, if you can see in the um, in the in the word cloud here, um, the safety something that is better than practice, lifelike flexibility. Do you want to, uh, Lucy? Maybe is there one that you see here that you'd like to to uh, if you, if you can read it uh, to pick on and 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 comment. And they're moving all the time as well. Yeah, I would um, say it's moving. Um, I think the authenticity one's really important. And I was just looking at the comments in the chat, and people were saying about how do you, how do you think this prepares your students for real world challenges? And I think that's really interesting around that authenticity. I always say to the students, you get out of this what you put into it. So if you go into it with the attitude that, um, you know, this is just a game or um, anything like that, then you might not get so much out of it. But if you go into it with that mindset that this is helping me develop um, and this is it, it's not about playing a game. It's about practicing in a safe environment so that nobody comes to any harm and you can you mm. can safely make mistakes um, then, then it's really, really beneficial and uh, the closest thing you can get to to reality to to practice in a safe way yeah and and I see experiential learning is getting bigger and it, it definitely is especially you know if it is something in for example if they were doing uh, body swaps at home or, or whether they were doing it in the VR I've had a lot of feedback from students saying um yeah I find it really useful at home. It's really great because I'm there on my own. It's a safe space. I can practice things again and again. But when it comes to doing things in the virtual reality, they're saying, oh, I really felt like I was there that time. And it's mm. almost like it's a memory in their head that they actually did have that, have that conversation with a, an actual person rather than I, I just think there's a, a separate sort of barrier. So they really felt like they've been there. I've had that, you know, straight from mm. students' mouths and things like the immersive room, etc. It's proper, you know, you're there, you're doing. It's a physical doing, and you feel you've been in that, you know, it's a safe environment. But they feel like they've been in it for real. I think it's it's it it, it is the very interesting thing about about the medium at the end of the day. Coming back to to virtual reality is 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 you both have the reptilian response of your brain, which is, uh, you know, like if I mess up that situation, there's going to be real impact on that, on that, on, on that patient. Whilst at the same time being aware that you are safe because that patient is just an avatar and they have yeah. no judgment and they have no, no, uh, no, uh, no actual risk. And you're absolutely right in terms of the way that it's processed like a memory and it stays in the brain like a memory, because that's exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's due to the experiential nature of the medium. And I reckon that's why, uh, um, uh, DNMC more, more and more will allow, uh, it's, immersive simulations to, to count as placement hours because in to an extent just like the flight simulator that, that we talked about at the beginning now to get your uh to be to be to be allowed to to fly a plane i think you can do up to 30 percent of your hours in a flight simulator and so that's it's um it's um it's the same idea here um mm -hmm. last question um is is we talked a lot about the benefits but we also have to be realistic uh, and warn people uh what are some of the concerns that you as as attendees to this uh, to this webinar have about deploying uh, uh, XR or AI in healthcare, and maybe Gemma and, and Lucy, uh, you can talk to some of the concerns that you had at the at the at the beginning. The first one being, is it is it doable at all? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Lucy, if you had a concern at the at the beginning uh, before you started. Yeah, I think um, obviously in real world simulation, you're allowed to pre brief undertake the simulation and then debrief is the biggest part it's bigger than the actual simulation itself and so my worry was simply undertaking um a software piece of xr or ai you know the lecturer has that important role of debriefing how will that happen in xr but many of the platforms they understand that pedagogy and the debrief and the pre-brief are in there um, asking you fantastic questions, giving you feedback and enabling the facilitator to structure a debrief as well. Um, so I think the, the underpinning theory, the pedagogy is there. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Is there is there anything on that on that, that work cloud, maybe the 
the risk of creating isolation or, or buy-in? Anything on that that you want to, to answer to, Gemma? Well I, well, I just see that how to scale. It is doable. Let's say we've got so many we've managed to get through because you need to make sure you get in parity across, you know, different um, professions because obviously nursing are, tend to be the largest numbers. It's unfair for them to not have the experience. So we we made that a big priority here to, to make sure that, uh, you know, no matter which program you're on, you you have that. And like I say, we've scaled up to quite high numbers. It may be a, a lateral way of doing it, such as, like I explained earlier, you know, in a classroom together, doing it, you know, you know doing it that way. Or um, there are different different tactics but it is possible to scale thinking laterally fantastic well um <laughs> it is i mean i i can i've seen the data i can uh, i can confirm that it's uh, it's it's possible to uh to, to scale um i will ask you something in in three minutes uh for the last minute which is you know the one word of advice that, that you have for attendees but in the meantime uh let's go uh, a quick word from our sponsor um, and our sponsor is ourselves, which is very convenient um, because that means um, we can say what we want. Um, just to say very, very briefly, we have about six hours of, of healthcare specific simulations or on communication scales uh, today, be it with patients or interprofessional as well. And we have a ton more uh, modules outside of healthcare that could be relevant on such things like active listening, teamwork, communication, uh, and so on. One thing to uh, to to uh, Lucy's point about about the pedagogy is all our simulations are built with partners like the NHS, like like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Royal Society of Medicine, and so on. And we align the learning objectives with the AACN, with the NMC, uh, to really help with uh, both the, the 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 mapping element uh, that was mentioned when working with educators. Um, but also when it comes to demonstrating the impact and getting buy-in, uh, it really helps to, to get that data, that performance analytics against those, um, those frameworks. Um, and lastly, um, if you're on the chat, you've met with, uh, with Laura, who heads our wonderful uh, customer success team. Laura and her team have been involved with about 250 uh, deployments in higher education, uh, so we've learned a thing or two doing that. And so we have put together a 45 slide deployment guide, uh, which obviously is applicable for body swaps, but not only for body swaps. If you're using any uh, XR application, you will find value there in terms of, you know, practical checklist before deploying, best practices for facilitation, the various ways to deploy between synchronous and asynchronous and the pros and cons of each, uh, and then a bunch of resources and templates that have been generously uh, given to us by our partners. So you have like a lesson planning checklist from, from colleges and at universities. So a lot of um, a lot of very helpful material here to, to help you cross that chasm between the pilots and being in uh, in Lucy's and uh, and Gemma's world, uh, so please do scan the, the QR code. And if you didn't have time, you can reach out to uh, Tyler if you are in the US or Canada, or to Janie if you are anywhere else in the rest of the world. Um, if you're in a free trial of the simulation, you can also scan that QR code or reach out to those emails. Uh, and for the last minute, as I promised, I'm going to go back to you, uh, Lucy and, and Gemma. Um, one. One last sentence, one last word of advice uh, for the attendees today. I don't know who wants to go first. I, I was just going to say it takes teamwork and getting the right people on that team and consulting everybody along it. So, you know, consulting your, your stakeholders, which would be IT, the academic, the, you know, technical team, if you have them and digital learning service for us has been key. Fantastic. So teamwork, brilliant. Lucy, last words are for you. I would say research slash preparation so that you're cost effective and you meet the needs of your learners before you've picked and, and bought everything and, and spent your money. <laughs> oh, yeah. So spending the money wisely to actually improve yeah. the, the, the learning outcomes. Uh, well, very, very wise words. Uh, thanks a lot for your time again today, uh, Gemma and Lucy. It's been it's been fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Uh, we'll have more of those webinars uh, very soon. And uh, wishing you a great rest of your day and 
allez les bleus à the Euros. That's it for us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you.